we have come as representatives of the 20th century society uh, to talk a bit about the legacy of architectural legacy and art legacy of Coventry in the streets and different perspectives on what has happened since really since the listing of post-war buildings became a possibility in the late 1980s. So uh, I'm joined by John Wright, who was the caseworker for the 20th Century Society, or one of the team of caseworkers uh, for a number of years, has now moved on, uh, but still very much in touch and represented on our casework committee, and Coco Whitaker, one of our current caseworkers. Um, and she has been having quite a lot to do with Coventry recently. So we haven't got all the stages in the history and we haven't had access to our archives very easily. So this is a, a little bit schematic, a little bit sketchy. I'm starting, um, and this is really the only image I have to show because it's quite amusing to those of us who were there to see our younger selves. This was a society visit, which is one of the things we do to make our presence known, to instruct our members. And uh, in those days, we used to alert the local press. And this was the kind of thing that happened. They sent a photographer out and did a group photo uh, of us. I am right at the back with my head missing, uh, standing up. Um, but this was a tour that I remember organizing. And it was one of the first where we went to look entirely at post-1945 buildings. Um, and uh, we were just morphing at that stage from being the 30s society after already 12 years of existence under that name to become in the following year, the 20th century society, which uh, it was obvious we had to change the name because it was so misleading if it was only the 30s. And one of the features I remember of that trip, first of all, a lot of people came they were really keen to come to Coventry from various parts of um, set, kind of points of the compass. And uh, we were walking down a street past an Art Deco cinema. Uh, now, Art Deco cinemas had been the mainstay of 30s society, interest and enthusiasm. And, and I remember noting at the time, not anybody broke step or even turned their head to look at it because we had now got a new focus, which was um, the architecture of the uh, 1950s, 60s, and a bit beyond. And it's in the context of this shift in uh, awareness, excitement, new discoveries, um, putting the pieces together of the stories of uh, reconstruction after the war. And as I said, from 1988, the potential to have post-war listing the buildings listed. So one of the first listings, first batch was Coventry Cathedral, which was always you know, one of the obvious ones um, and its status has never been in doubt. So having done that introduction, I'm now going to hand over initially to John to talk about uh, some of his experiences and his perception of the background and the forces of play. Thanks very much, Alan. Yeah, I was the, if I remember correctly, I was the caseworker at the 20th Century Society between 2005 and 2000 and early 2012. Um, and in that time, you know, Coventry was, you know, a constant thing on the horizon. The buildings of Coventry were, you know, fairly consistent bit of casework along with the buildings of Plymouth, I suppose. Um, and I think I was going there mostly for, you know, to meet historic England, to deal with the never solved, I don't think, um, issue of disabled access at the cathedral, um, which has been such a long running process for them in terms of getting people up the various very elegant steps that Spence designed to the back of the cathedral and the, and the chapels in particular, which constituted major problems. So I think that was my first trip as a caseworker. I just want to go back a little bit and show and show the sort of excitement behind um, behind the rebuilding of Coventry, which was, you know, as we all know, very heavily bombed in the war, and the, 
the cathedral was the, was the sort of central component, but uh, and as Alan rightly said, that was the sort of, that was the easy win in terms of, you know, listing its post-war heritage, which was, you know, by and large built by Coventry City Council. Um, and in quite a different way to Plymouth, if we are to compare them, you know, where there's a group of sort of quite well-known named architects designing various things overseen by, you know, the best town planner of the time. What happened in Coventry was rather more local affair, at least regional. Um, and this excitement is carried by this very exuberant AAD cover from 19, 1958. I'll just show that. Um, this is a design by um, Gibson for the upper precinct area, and it showed initially the, the Trinity Church Tower in the centre. I mean, it wasn't quite completed like this, but that basic idea um, held true into the final design of upper precinct, and I thought it would be worth showing. In terms of post-war reconstruction, you know, there was really no... Coventry and Plymouth were the, were the, prime, the prime examples of this um, uh, new rebuilding and this, you know, sort of 1950s, early 1960s architecture. Both cities have tremendous examples of, of, of that period. They both have had rather divergent paths in terms of conservation. And I would say that, you know, in the years I was a caseworker, we were fighting as much with um, the city council as we were with public opinion, um, but neither were particularly <laughs> in favour or supportive of, um, you know, of either listing or retention. Um, and, you know, a lot of these buildings were, were becoming you know, run down or altered to an extent that was threatening, you know, their future as, as either a listed building or as heritage per se. So we tried to keep an eye on, on Coventry, um, but of course at this stage, very few of the buildings were, um, were protected. So we were not hearing about them through the usual routes. We were not getting, you know, um, planning applications in the normal way. Um, that the society responds to things. So we needed eyes and ears on the ground. And I think the, the, there were a couple of people in the West Midlands, Andy Foster in particular, who I was in contact a lot with over both Birmingham and Coventry, you know, were really helpful to kind of alerting us to things. I, I mentioned the cathedral because um, I've gone back there recently to do the conservation management plan, which is a, which is a Getty funded project and you know, the first management plan the cathedral has, has ever had. Um, and like I said, it was a rather kind of easy win. And as Alan said, it's, it, you know, there's just never been any kind of debate about its architectural importance. But it has um, had its context change considerably. Where this photo is taken from, you know, there's huge development by the university uh, which has changed the context and setting of the building quite quite a lot. Its relationship to the city centre has been altered quite a bit too. And, um, you know, it still faces a number of conservation uh, issues which won't be easy to solve. Um, not least the Chapel of Industry, um, which is the round chapel to the right of this picture. Um, which once overlooked the industry of Coventry, which is now no longer there. And that building is suffering, that, that, that chapel is suffering from a considerable number of um, conservation issues that are you know, going to take a lot of money and effort to solve. But the cathedral, you know, despite its high grade and, um, you know, it's, it's widely appreciated stance, it's not, it's not, not quite in the conservation position that it's, that its listing grade um, would suggest. And the interior is much the same. Um, the tapestry in particular is some, um, which was a case for me at C20 in terms of how to clean it, um, has just recently had some environmental um, control. Tobit Curtis Associates have been doing some work on trying to work out how, how fast it's degrading. And in the not too distant future, there may be uh, 
dis decisions for C20 to have with the with the cathedral about how they look after repair or even replace that tapestry, which would be interesting and kind of pioneering, I think. Um, one interesting thing I learned recently is that those those shaded areas you can see are not actually um, lines, they're actually sort of, it, it's dirt formed on the, on the front of the tapestry that's collected over time that gives it that kind of rippled appearance. Um, let's talk about listings a bit because we did put things forward fairly consistently while I was there. The railway station um, at Coventry, which is a very fine building, was almost completely intact and featured uh, internal artwork and um, this very, you know, kind of expressive inside outside um, relationship, which sits just um, away from the city centre somewhat, um, was probably another fairly easy win for listing. But at, at the time, um, you know, not everyone appreciated its merits. I don't remember an argument at the casework committee, but I do remember, um, you know, quite a lively discussion about it. And I think we, um, you know, looking back, that seems a very obvious thing to have, to have got listed. And a lot of people come into Coventry that way. So it's a sort of a gateway building. In 2007, uh, we, we started a campaign for post-war murals aided um, by Lynn Pearson um, with, with, with Alan giving a considerable amount of guidance as well on you know, what, kind of, what kind of things nationwide could we consider to be listable um, we put together a map, which I think is still on the 20th Century Society website under the campaigns tab. And in 2009, um, the three tons mural at, um, by, by, by William Mitchell um, in, in Coventry, which is in Bull's Yard, is, uh, was listed. I mean, it's part of the building, so it's not really something that can be moved. I, I think Coco is going to talk a bit more about that. but. Uh, um, a really interesting piece of post-war design by one of the you know, one of the great um, and sadly now departed um, artists of the post-war period in terms of buildings decoration. And then I think the final thing um, that was listed while I was there was the uh, was the market, um, which is a fairly big building and uh, had this car park on the roof and still functioned as a market. Um, which was very much part of the city plan, totally plugged into the precincts and the way that the pedestrian and traffic relationship of Coventry that was embedded in the city plan worked. Um, and I remember Elaine Harwood pushing pretty hard for this to be listed at Historic England. And at the time it was pretty controversial, I think, because we hadn't listed a great deal of this kind of structure. I mean, I think the Pannier Market in Plymouth was already listed at this stage, but um, this was seen as part of that post-war canon of buildings that, you know, was kind of a bit touch and go in terms of conservation. Could this be listed? Will we know how to look after it? What if its purpose changes? What, what could we do with a building like this? You know, do we, do we scupper development? And all those things kind of came into play. And I was quite worried about that not getting through for political reasons. Uh, I'll skip that. And I think what, what, other, what other interesting things to draw out of my experience while I was at C20 was the comparisons with Plymouth. Um, and, you know, buildings like this, uh, this is Coventry, um, you know, the simple, the, the, the kind of ordinary um, 1950s buildings, quite austere by today's standards, but, but pretty handsome and functional, uh, you know, low rise brick things with some quite nice detail in places, some of which had artwork on them, you know, were good architecture of the period. Um, and you know, particularly when one considers the, you know, the austerity of the time, particularly in the fifties uh, and the lack of building materials, you know, on hand, 
the fact that you know such quality architecture got built in places like Coventry, Exeter, Plymouth, you know, is 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 kind of remarkable. So I thought, you know, we thought um, C20 thought that you know both those cities really needed a conservation area designation, and we were pushing for that for for some time. That's now happened in Plymouth, which is um, you know protected swathes of the central part of Abercrombie's original city plan, although not all of it, I have to say. Um, but I think Coventry also you know, still requires that because we've got fragmentary listings, but we don't have um, heritage protection for you know, what you might call the spaces between the nodes and the public areas and the provision for space, light and art and architecture that made up the city centre and made it special. Um, just at the tail end of, of my tenure at society, we looked at the elephant, which was an extension to the sports um, facility in Coventry, the, the sports hall and swimming pool. And um, this hasn't been listed, and I, you know, obviously, it's a, I don't think it's um, a building that's necessarily, well, it certainly divides opinion, um, not at C20. <laughs> Very likely, but um, but you know this was a contentious one, and I think it's um, an in an interesting building that deserves deserves more attention. I think we will probably still be looking at that. And I think finally the Coventry City Centre Architects Department building, um, which is called CC Two, I think, did get listed, um, and that was perhaps the first of the sort of good ordinary um, buildings of that period. It's a nice precinct building on Pilotti. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that you know, recently there was some resistance. Uh, there was a resistance to that listing from Congress City Council and they tried to demolish it. So I think we still clearly got some way to go. Uh, John, um, can I yes. interject there? Um, yes. Could you talk a bit more about that building and about if people don't understand it, how would you persuade them that it was so important? Well, the, the listing description, Alan, for it um, is probably as much balanced on the importance of it as the, as the site of Coventry City Council's architects department, as it is about the building. I think there's, you know, there, there are other buildings like this in Coventry and certainly plenty in Plymouth where, you know, good quality um, cellular architecture on the inside, um, good quality concrete, um, part of the townscape, um, if you like, low rise and easily accessible, permeable to other places, um, that I would consider this to be part of my good ordinary bracket in terms yeah. of its architectural design. Well, I um, do agree, I agree with you about that and I like that phrase, yeah. um, but just looking at it, uh, if you see the way it uses squares and the, the white that I imagine are the opening windows are yes, so. paired up as squares, but they sit within uh, a square, which is made by the, the other window and the solid panel below. And probably if you started drawing diagonals over it, you'd find there's, there's a whole series of geometric relationships bedded in there, which I think help one to feel comfortable with it. it. It sort of looks nice. Uh, and the other feature I see in that is, is that view through underneath. Uh, this is not yes. a building that's going to making a barrier. It's, it's a gateway inviting you to continue, continue on foot into you know, one of the first major post-war pedestrian centers. Yes. Well, I, yes, I, I agree with that. And I think this shares something with, um, you know, bits of other bits of Coventry and other other bits of squares and precincts in, in post-war planned cities everywhere. Um, but yes, I like your reading of the, of the facade. I haven't really appreciated that, but I think um, it's worth, worth reiterating again that there was a kind of communal or historic value that was not entirely attached to the architecture and it was a recognition from historic England that actually what happened in here was tremendously important, even if they haven't listed all the buildings that were, that were designed in there. Sort of yeah. yeah, 
good. Sorry to interrupt. Do, do no, on. no, very good interruption. Um, I think this is my final slide, and I, I think this Kirko will probably correct me if I'm wrong, but this is also part of the council, um, you know, complex. And difficult to fall head over heels in love with it, but, uh, but, but this building's gone, and I always loved that link, which is incredibly bold. Um, it's difficult to love the building too much, but, it, but you know, it's just an indication that they seem to continue to take out those pieces which, um, how can you say, uh, 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 offended a different reading of the history of Coventry, um, other than the one which is rooted in the medieval or, you know, um, slightly later. And that, that anything that happened afterwards, um, no matter whether it was 1950s Festival of Britain style or you know, 1970s um, contextual brick modernism, then it, it's not welcomed. It's not welcome and it doesn't deserve to be there in some way. And that the decisions made post-war are or were um, mistakes of some kind. And I think, you know, society has had the devil of a job and, you know, convincing the council in particular otherwise, and it hasn't always won with historic England either. Um, and I'd probably just end that by saying that Plymouth, I think, you know, <coughs> ha has turned a corner in that regard. And it's because of the city centre conservation area designation in particular, is probably on a track to much greater public awareness and acceptance, um, much better heritage protection for the fabric of the post-war city centre, uh, and maybe even, um, you know, the generation of tourism and visitation because of it. And I think that there are that there are good lessons for Coventry there because um, it still has enough that's worth saving and that can tell us what happened, you know, immediately post-war and beyond. Well, so, thanks, thanks very much. You, um, Shall we hand over to Coco and then I hope we'll have a bit of time just to kind of review it all at the end. Hmm. I'll move the slides on, Coco. This is your first one. Great. So yeah, I'm, I'm the sort of current caseworker um, and I'm just going to talk briefly about what we've been doing recently in Coventry. Um, so we've been involved um, in a proposal to redevelop large um, sites in the centre and um, that's called the city centre south site um, and it includes um, a number of really notable um, 20th century buildings, including the Market Hall which um, John's shown a slide of, and you can see that here. And that's, that was um, grade two listed in 2009. Um, in the next slide, um, you can see, John, could you go through to the next slide? Sure. Yeah, that's right. So this is, um, so that site is also home to the Bull Yard Shopping Precinct, which you can see here. Um, and this was an area laid out by um, Arthur Ling, who was the city architect and planner, um, and he was succeeded by Terence Gregory, and that was sort of created in the 1960s. Um, and there should be another photo in the next slide. Yeah, so that's the kind of iconic image of the bull yard with that, that font above the parapet. Um, and in the next slide, you can see um, Hartford Street, which is also part of that site. Um, with these shops um, by, I think it's WS Hatchell and Partners, um, created in the 60s and 70s. And it has these incredible um, fiberglass panels by William Mitchell, the sculptor. Um, and this, this is one of the streets that was pedestrianized by the council in the post-war period. And this is all part of the same site. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see what's happening to the area. So. Um, this is the redevelopment plan that's being proposed by um, Shearer Property Group and Chapman Taylor Architects, who are working with Coventry City Council. And what they're proposing to do is to retain um, the listed marker hall, which you can see sort of in the back part of the image, the circular building there. Um, but it's gonna be sort of divorced from its context because 
um, the bull yard and all the other buildings we've just seen are going to be um, demolished. Um, and we've been sort of trying to fight this, this application um, because we think it will result in um, the sort of the loss of what makes Coventry city centre really special and that's a sort of post-war architecture and planning. Um, the next slide has another view of those proposals and they've been quite sort of harshly criticised by some including I think Rowan Moore from The Guardian described it as um, a weak imitation of London's Covent Garden market which is I quite like. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this application um, went to the council's planning committee in April and they um, recommended that it was granted unless it was called in by the Secretary of State. And so we wrote quite a lengthy letter to the Secretary of State asking him to call it in and to um, ultimately reject it. But unfortunately, um, it hasn't been called in. And so the council have now got the power to grant permission. So this is set to go ahead. And it is a real shame. Um, I mean, as John said, this area should be a conservation area and it should be protected. Um, so this has been a bit of a struggle for the society. Um, so the next slide, I've just got some images of the art. So the public art was like a, a really major part of, um, of the sort of post-war planning and laying out of Coventry. Um, and there are quite a number of, of public artworks that are located within this area that's set for redevelopment, um, including this one, which is called the Phoenix, or just Phoenix, um, in Hartford Street. And that was unveiled, I think, in 1962. Um, this one's got a, there's a planning condition in place, which means that this needs to be relocated within the new development, which is good. Um, but I think our position on this has been that um, while we're really pleased it's going to be retained, we're, we sort of regret, regret the loss of its original context, um, which is quite, a, I think, an important part of the way it's understood as an artwork. Um, the next slide shows um, another work, sorry for the slightly poor image quality, but this is called A Thread Through Time. Um, this is in the bull yard. Um, and this was created in the 90s and it has the same condition, which means it needs to be relocated. But again, it won't be read within the context that it's currently in. And that's a real, um, an important part of its sort of artistic interest, I think. Um, the next slide has got um, an image of a work called Sir Guy and the Dun Cow, which is one of my favorites by Alma Ramsey. And this is located between the bull yard and Shelton Square. Um, and for this and for a number of other works, which we're, I think in the next slide, the council has sort of recommended that the work is retained, but there's no condition meaning that this has to happen. So it's kind of unclear whether these are gonna be incorporated in the new development or if we're gonna lose these post-war public artworks. Um, and the, what the images you see here are of a work called Peeping Tom, um, which is in Hartford Street. And, the William Mitchell panels, which I showed earlier, which are also in Hartford Street. Um, so the future of these artworks is uncertain and, and we're sort of trying to push for them to be um, retained and, and kept, within, kept within Coventry and on public view. And the next work is um, of the William Mitchell mural on the former Three Tons public house, which John showed. Um, and that was grade two listed um, and is so it does have some protection, um, but the current proposals uh, mean that the building it's located on is going to be demolished, um, and so the work will need to be um, relocated somewhere else within the sort of city centre. Um, and I think at the moment the um, the applicant is proposing to put it somewhere public and somewhere where you can see both sides of its elevations, because it's this sort of incredible double-sided piece, um, which is good. But again, we sort of prefer if it was retained in situ, um, believing that, that its original context plays a part in the way it's understood. Um, and that's the, the sort of position we've taken for the other artworks too. Um, so yeah, we're still sort of fighting that that application and that, that case, which you think is really gonna drastically 
changed the character of um, Coventry city centre. The next slide, um, I think this is one of my last two slides, which just show, talk a bit about the um, Civic Centre 2 case. This is the building that John showed earlier and, it's, um, and he provided actually a really good image of it attached to the um, other civic build buildings that were originally on the site. Um, so the sort of history of this one is that it was grade two listed, um, but the other buildings that were sort of associated with it were turned down from listing and they were demolished. And so it now sort of stands in isolation. And um, we're involved in this case because of the next slide, which shows the, um, the plan, plans by Broadway um, Malin, I'm not sure if that's all right, um, to sort of envelop the new building within a new build um, to create this new sort of complex of spaces for the university. And so this is, yeah, one of sort of several cases that we're, um, we have been involved with recently and um, still sort of fighting to protect the sort of more everyday um, but still interesting buildings um, that exist in Coventry. Um, Alan and John, I'm not sure if you want to add to that. Well, thank you very much for bringing it up to date. Uh, I don't know how one puts across. It's not that we always consider that the replacements are bad, although sometimes we may, or that they're not really good enough. Um, but there's something about the integrity of, uh, of a group of buildings that is admittedly you know, quite a difficult task to um, uh, you know, make that safe and appreciated and kept, uh, especially buildings that are perceived to be no longer sustainable and that sort of thing with a, a lot of external glass. But I think it's important to say it has been done and it can be done. And I think John's point about Coventry selling itself, uh, although, you know, City of Culture has has um, uh, happened. Uh, this is so much part of the identity uh, that uh, you know we're going to carry on anyway, whether people appreciate what we're doing or not. Yeah, and I think um, I think this you know it's all the more surprising. One wants to be positive, but it's 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 a track record which has uh, not been derailed by you know, huge new or the growth of a public awareness and taste for the kind of architecture that's been lost in Coventry that 20th century society have been, have had a hand in. Um, and it's almost, you know, almost tempts one to think that it's kind of willful uh, against, um, you know, the grain of a growing appreciation for what, what, we, what we all think of as a, a golden period of British architecture. Um, and so when you look at images like this and see that, as Coco rightly said, I think, you know, what, what's not, what's lost is, um, you know, the sum of a number of different parts, not all of which are going to be um, good enough to get listed, but which together have a, a quality, an innate quality that... Um, listing doesn't really account for, which is why I think, you know, the comparison with Plymouth in terms of the, the dual listing the spaces and the, uh, and the good buildings or the, or the artwork <laughs> in the good buildings next to conservation area designation, which protects the lesser stuff, keeps the plan together. Um, and that, that's, that's just, I mean, the, the things you just showed, Coco, show that that is, going to be almost completely dissolved as, a, as Gibson's original city plan. Yes. Uh, John, did you get the um, single slide PowerPoint I just emailed you? Because uh, I think you've got to better go. capacity to put it up. Uh, it came in an email, did it come? Uh, sorry, audience, to um, <laughs> yes, interrupt you. Um, extra image. This, this is it. Yes, I, I'm showing this with the reason. Uh, it's a bit self-indulgent, perhaps. Can you see uh, that? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. We haven't, away. we've got a bit of board around it. Anyway, I do remember sometime in the 1990s, 
going up to Coventry by train uh, to appear on local TV and explain why the lower precinct was valuable and important and uh, why it shouldn't. At that point, the proposal was just to put in escalators to get people up to the upper level because the shops at the upper level were not doing so well. And uh, partly in retrospect, uh, you know, what's happening with retail is um, such that, you know, the need to let all the shops uh, and have lots of people walking into them doesn't seem to be so relevant anymore now. We couldn't have seen that coming, but um, more particularly, I remember taking uh, a book that had this upper image on the cover, this um, 15th century Italian painting, which is quite well known, particularly in terms of planning theory. And it had struck me that the people who designed the lower pre precinct and put the circular Godiva cafe in there must have known this. And mm. whether they did or not, they were latched on to the same idea of this sort of order, symmetry, central axis, because this axis, although there are things in the way, leads up to the spire of the cathedral. And it struck me forcibly how, what a strong idea that was. Very untypical for England, but it was part of that post-war uh, idea that you know, we can change the rules, we can become new and better people through our architecture and design. Uh, but uh, it could go back, uh, it's not impossible, uh, but it seems a bit remote and improbable, I have to say. Perhaps I'll just wind up by first of all, thanking Coco and John very much for their contributions and to say for whoever is listening, please help us by taking out a subscription to the 20th Century Society, which is not a lot of money for all the good that you can do through it and all the goodies that you can get, including our beautiful magazine and our biennial uh, journal full of new research and uh, exciting stuff about uh, buildings after 1914. Thank you very much. <laughs>